Uh, thanks for Damit and the committee to have me uh, for <laughs> yet another um, robots and art um, workshop. Uh, hopefully I won't repeat myself over the last 10 years. Uh, in the title that you have here is the um, kinesthetic entanglements. You, you notice that you won't see the word emotion or sentimentality. I just tried to situate this at a different level. Um, it's a quite an incredible task to report about emotions and sentiments and uh, just to model those in a fruitful way. So, you know, just to reflect back on presentation before about the self-reporting of pain, you know, just give you examples of the complexity at hand to um, have a machine to represent all these uh, spectrums of behaviors. So that, that's, that's a, quite um, a big task. So this is why I decided to go and use the word kinesthetic empathy instead. And throughout the um, presentation, uh, the way I structured it is I have about seven works. So I'll go over time now. I'll just race through them very quickly. I just want you to grasp bits and pieces and hopefully you can glue them all back together. But through the presentation, I just want to reflect on a book that was uh, published last year, I think, by Stanton Garner. It's called like, Kinesthetic Spectatorship. So it's quite interesting because at the same time, when you think about kinesthetic empathy, is basically when you're observing an object that is moving. So you try to establish some connection. So hopefully that's, this is something you try to establish with robots. Uh, there's a specific case in theater that the, uh, it's a shared enactment. We are there to perceive performers on the stage, but the performers at the same time have a certain kind of techniques to make themselves uh, aware, uh, to establish some links with the audience and so forth, which is exactly the, the task, somehow a very similar task at hand that we need to do with um, machines. So throughout the, there will be a one quote per uh, project that I'm gonna show you. And I think one of the best ways to introduce things that are relating to emotion and representing emotion is uh, looking back to a very old work, which is called La Cour des Miracles. It's an installation, a performative installation. Um, if I look at the quote from Garner, is like emotion manifests themselves in movement. There's no perception of space of movement, no vertigo or lust of balance, no care is given or received, no sound heard or uttered gesture of capture of grasping that is not accompanied by emotion or induced by a hit. So basically I think that we, we can we have to look at emotions, sensations, and if you look at your own body, you're constantly being uh, you know aware and uh, shifting your sense of self-perception, emotion and so forth by what's happening around you and what you're actually enacting yourself. So this piece here is about robot misery. And there were a series of robots demonstrating pain. Uh, this was kind of a bug that endlessly tries to go back on his four feet. Uh, there were beggars. Uh, there is no actually utterance of words. These are like more like screams. Uh, they're more, let's say, abstract mechanical shapes that try or zoomorphic shape that try to implement uh, very specific behaviors. And what becomes important in a case like this is uh, uh, when I build all the, in all the machines you're gonna see, I'm not looking for an ubiquitous robot that can do everything. I'm just building a very specific robot for each character that becomes kind of a niche to implement a certain behavior and so forth. So I, uh, it's kind of like a way by learning by building or learning by doing, try to achieve the goal to eventually build something which is much more versatile, let's say like a normal uh, human performer. So you have all kinds of different characters that are set up in uh, the place called uh, La Cour des Miracles. Uh, La Cour des Miracles actually is a, is a slums in, in Paris. Uh, it's an actual space. Uh, and what is important in a, in a context like this, and it's gonna be, I'm gonna be repeating this throughout all the other works is uh, the body in there, like the, there's different levels of reading the body. Like you have the body will be in pain right here. 
uh, at the top, but there's the body where you're gonna have establish some kind of empathy. So if I look at, let's say, uh, if the object wants to emanate pains, they have to have some certain amount of cues, certain amount of like relation that I have to establish with the object. So we're pretty good at establishing all kinds of relation from the mechanomorphic to, to the anim animalistic to, you know, like the, the abstract saying, okay, this is possible, this is different and so forth. So we kind of project ourselves and have the world project upon us as well. And at the end as, as well, there are like social and cultural body that's very high level that start to entangle and enmesh all kind of different layers that gives different readings of the bodies, different, uh, all the multitude of bodies. In this case, for instance, the slum of Paris and the Cour des Miracles was made in the, in the sense that they all became different when they were living in this area. Uh, so I'm gonna go through this. So this is the resume, like little stop gap in between each element. So if I move to the another uh, machine, which is uh, the Tiller Girls, uh, perception is always perspectival. It depends where I am. It's actually like, you know, we're not in the world, we're off the world. So when I watch an object uh, behaving, depends where I am, which context I am, depends, you know, probably how I feel and so forth. So it changed the object itself. You know, the object is not a, a pure object. It's, you know, it's intersubjective because, you know, it's, this is the balance I'm trying to establish. So in this case, the, the context, which is set up, um, I'm just gonna show the first, the robot. Uh, I really like this little machine because it was very energetic very expressive. The only thing I want to say about this one is like, has no sensor. The construction is self-stabilizing by construction. So it's very, um, let's say, uh, opening a lot of vocabulary for expressiveness. And if you mix this with a proper context, which is called the Tiller Girls, which uh, uh, let's say scholarly uh, works about Description about this work talks about the mass ornament massification uh, using mechanical interpreters and so forth. So when you're mixing all this, when you look at the object behaving, uh, people look at different motions. When the robot is by itself, people see the robot as being energetic, happy, jumping around and so forth. When the two robots together, suddenly people describe it as dancing so, and so forth. So when you have the context and, and you start mixing it. So basically uh, what happened with the Tiller girls, uh, we relate to these objects because the, the gate is very close to some of the gates we share and the, the whole context. Shifting to the blind robot. Um, what happened is, is uh, if you start having a share enactment, you can start not only talking about the intentionality of objects, but inter intentionality, which is shared between you and the object. In this case, it's a robot that you sit in the front of the robot and the robot will touch you to recall what a blind person uh, supposedly is doing when they need to explore you and have a certain dialogue with you. So when I built this machine, uh, I was interested in situating a very specific context, which is touch, uh, which is inside your kinesphere. Uh, I wanted to use a modality which was quite uh, invasive, which is touching you. So a lot of people actually like, they're really scared of being touched, but at one point the threshold is passed. The first time they touch, they get into more uh, communication with the robot. So tons of different examples. So maybe I just run a little bit of the robot in action. From зритель и его реакция на тактильное взаимодействие с роботом. Слепой робот. Художественное исследование телесного интеллекта и проблемы embodiment на стыке робототехники и социального моделирования. So what happened in the case of the, um, the blind robot is uh, what you have is 
you accept the robot to touch you. When I measure this with the psychological test, the, the, uh, the, you accept to be touched because you understand the intention of the robot. Uh, I made like uh, test groups uh, uh, that on some part, people were saying like, this is a, an object that wants to, um, it's a medical device that wants to make some measurement of you. And, and the other group, I said, okay, this is a blind robot. It wants to touch you and people perceive the touch of the robot in a better way when they were touched by the blind robot uh, and so forth. So in a case like this, the old intelligence or the old, let's say, capacity of the robot to touch you gently, a lot of it comes from the title of the robot. So the whole context is how you situate the intelligence or the competence of this robot, which is interesting, the name of the robot. And of course, in this case, the blind robot, the embodiment is an anthropomorphic uh, situation. Uh, what happens as well when you start looking at objects that are let's say, mechanical in nature, like sometimes when you look at another object, you, you have a disconnect. So there could be a failure to not see any empathy, no, no real engagement, especially when it comes to, for instance, if you look at, let's say, virtuoso in sport or dancers and so forth, you look at them and say, well, I can't do this. Or well, there are things that you will, will be able to do at one point and so forth. So the evolution was just a work, uh, was a work that used a lot of extensions on the body to transform the anatomy and to make them in objects that are chimerical and see how they will devolve the human body in the performance. In Inferno, this is a performance where we take audience people, we put exoskeletons on their body, about 24 of them. They untrain, they don't know what's going to happen. And we make them dance in a strange modern ritual for about an hour. So you have spectators who are watching the people with the exoskeletons. You have the people with exoskeletons watching each other or trying to dance with each other. So. In, in this case, uh, the empathy is a function of the otherness. If my subjectivity were one with everybody else, there will be no more empathy, language, or intersubjective achievement. So that's quite a very strong statement. Empathy arises when another subjectivity impinges on mine, announces itself as a limit to my egocentric world. So maybe that's a way to probably admit that the robot will always be another external object, and then we have to find a way maybe to mediate with them. It won't be like a pure presentation as much as we do with the, the rest of the world. So in this case, when the people are wearing the exoskeletons and they dancing with each other, it's quite intriguing how we ask the people to self-report about how the movement moves their body, what's their reaction with the sensation. As an audience member, when you see the people dancing and moving, you probably wonder, like how are they reacting to this? Is it painful? Is it pleasant? And so forth. So the lot of question that probably arises through the performance. So maybe I can just play a little moment. So Inferno is like, again, all the context. You have a hybrid situation in this case. It's augmented bodies. And a recent piece I've done, which is called Repeat. Uh, it's a piece about repetition and uh, modern workers, which dealing with the fourth industrial revolution. Similar idea as the uh, exoskeleton for Inferno, but in this case, they are dancers and they will perform, uh, let's say what happened in a shipping factory. So for about half an hour in the front of your eyes, they're just moving boxes endlessly like uh, Sisyphus, uh, instead of rolling his rock all the way up the hill, they basically just moving boxes around. So again, in this case, the, the uh, the strenuous aspect of it is something that calls itself or something that you cannot do or you will fail to do as well as a constant repetition. 
So these are examples. So these are the number of boxes that are shipped daily in America, I think. These are iconography that you will find everywhere uh, about exoskeletons. These are passive exoskeletons. I bought them and they are deployed in, in manufacturing uh, areas. And as well, it deals with dense movement and strenuous activities. Maybe just a quick glimpse. And finally, uh, I'm dealing uh, the work I'm dealing and doing these days. It's about alterity. Uh, a beautiful quote by Tosig is that uh, alterity is not a thing itself; it's a relationship. So uh, it's a series of robots that are dealing with more like animal behavior. So I'm trying to um, have them, um, let's say have more feral behavior and they are more. I put them in a scenario where the visitor is at the same flat level as let's say the, um, the visitor. So uh, they will be both in darkness, for instance, they will be both like have a common ground of operating. So they, uh, they kind of like one nut is above the other. So I try to put, create discomfort in the viewer's uh, person. So to conclude, so um, the idea is like, when you think about motor empathy, emotional empathy, and all these kinds of empathy is like, when you start thinking about them holistically, uh, that's important. And I think this is what theater tries to achieve when they put uh, performers on the stage. And I think that this is uh, what I want to leave you with this. So it's my 15 minutes are over. Thank you.